Did you know that because most victims of the Holocaust do not have graves, they've been commemorated with stumbling stones in more than 1,200 locations throughout Europe? As of 2019, there have been 75,000 brass stumbling stone plaques installed on the sidewalks in front of the Holocaust victims' last known place of freely chosen residence, making them the largest decentralized memorial in the world. We'll discuss this and other interesting facts about the Holocaust with writers Simone Yehuda and Joy Wolf Enzer on this episode of The Curious Professor. I'm Dr. B. Welcome to the Curious Professor podcast, where I take listeners on a journey of discovery to explore the people, places, artifacts, and natural wonders that spark my curiosity. On this episode of the Curious Professor podcast, we'll discuss living in the shadow of the Holocaust with writers Simone Yehuda and Joy Wolf Enzer. But first, a trivia question. What does the Hebrew word chased mean? I'll have the answer for you at the end of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Simone Yehuda and Joy Wolf Enzer on the show today. Simone began as a poet and has two published books of poetry, Thaw and Lifting Water. She has served as founding editor for Eclipse Magazine and poetry editor at Bridges Journal. She's also a multi-produced playwright, including a mystery willing off-Broadway, and has served as playwright-in-residence at Detroit's Attic Theater. Professor Emeritus at Siena Heights University, she's now a full-time screenwriter. Some of her screenplays, Jerusalem Road, The New Eve, and Love and Homicide, focus on the reconciliation of opposites divided by cultural and identity barriers. Dr. Joy Wolf Enzer is a psychologist whose clinical, teaching, and leadership activities over 40-plus years have centered on the social detriments of health and the multi-generational legacy of trauma. She grew up in New York City and has lived in Ann Arbor since 1973. Her involvement in The Ones Who Remember, Second Generation Voices of the Holocaust, has deepened her attachment to Krakow, her ancestral home. Joy and her husband, Doug, a fellow psychologist, have two daughters and one granddaughter. When I learned about The Ones Who Remember, my curiosity was immediately piqued and I wanted to learn more. I hope this interview with Simone and Joy will spark your curiosity, too. Welcome to the show, Simone and Joy. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for having us. Joy, tell us about the book and how you got involved with this project. So the origin story of the book is that we're all part of a collective of sorts at our Reformed Jewish Synagogue in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We call ourselves Generations After, and we're all second-generation descendants of survivors of Nazi persecution from various wartime experiences, including going into hiding, being imprisoned in slave labor camps, having other kinds of detention, concentration camps, etc. And in late 2003, early 2004, the founder of our group approached our rabbi to suggest that we could enrich our annual Holocaust remembrance services in order to move the congregation from the incomprehensible figure of six million dead to um, bringing to light the actual lived experience of individuals whose lives had meaning. This was a sweet and gutsy move on the part of our founder, um, whose name is Martha Solent. She approached our rabbi with a boatload of good intentions and a little bit of chutzpah. And our rabbi, to his eternal credit, said, get some people together and see what you can come up with, which spoke to a kind of radical openness to new ways of um, having lay-led initiatives in the congregation. So we wrote our first original service for the Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Remembrance Day service in the spring of 2004, um, after which our rabbi invited us to do a similar service for the afternoon of Yom Kippur poor, the Day of Atonement, because the way that we were centering our parents' voices resonated deeply with our congregation, and this became an annual tradition. The group grew from an original core of six to eight people. It 
it's now up to 18 people. We had survivor generation participants in the early days. Sadly, now um, we're down to one survivor member of our group, but she's remarkable. She wrote the foreword to our book. And after about 10 years of writing services, we said, why don't we compile an anthology of our parents' stories? I mean, how hard could that be? Simone was part of that original core group um, together with myself and Irene and the late Myra Fox and the other three editors whose names appear on our cover. Simone um, withdrew from participating because her screenwriting career was taking off. Irene withdrew because she was writing her own memoir. Myra sadly passed away of cancer four years ago, and that left the the core group of four co-editors, of which I'm one. So this was not a memoir of author-specific chapters. It was a collage of thematically grouped narratives, and we sent it off to readers, um, several of whom said, this is fine, but where are your voices? And we sat with that challenge for a while and decided to refocus our manuscript on our own voices. So we completely revised the manuscript, worked with a remarkable developmental editor named Polly Rosenwake, um, a poet and editor, short story writer and editor here in Ann Arbor, who was working with 15 living authors with varying degrees of expertise from a great deal of expertise, those of us um, late to the game and and did a great deal of deep work with Polly. And the result was the book that you hold. Um, It would never have happened without our Generations After group, which never would have happened without our founder and never would have happened without the rabbi who encouraged us to go for it. Thank you for giving an overview of how this project came about. And I'm curious, Simone, how did you get involved in the project? Well, as Joy said, I left the group for a while and then came back and they were deeply in the throes. And fortunately, I was there at the beginning when people actually started to write the chapters. So I was in on that from the beginning. This group is, is especially with COVID, I think it's be kind of a second family for many of us. And we're not with our families. And uh, certainly the book, doing the book together, reading each other's chapters and presenting our chapters to audiences now really has created very strong, powerful bonds of friendship uh, for me anyway. And we have been thrilled with the book's reception. Uh, Reviews have been wonderful. Joy can tell you about. It's just amazing how this has taken off. And when we had our book launch a few weeks ago at our temple, there were over, I mean, there were about 300 people there. The bookstore that had supplied the books, they sold out of books. I mean, it it was just like, we felt like we were really contributing something to the community and to the world. And uh, we had never really been sure about whether anyone could be really interested and so forth. So that's why I got involved. And if you want all the details, Joy, as one of the editors, really has all the details about the review. I mean, we all collected. I asked different people for interviews, uh, for blurbs. And so we all participated with that. But the actual reviews and reception have just been remarkable and unexpected. And uh, we've talked about this in uh, those of us that have been involved in academic publishing I mean, this is not, well, it's kind of, you know, scholarly a little, you know, and um, the sales far exceed anything that I've ever heard of, you know, in, in, in that kind of publication. So it's really been an honor to be part of this group. And we are very grateful to have you, you know, helping us get the word out this way. Well, it's such a unique idea. I've seen other books where they have spoken about the stories of people, obviously, who were victims of the Holocaust. But this is the first book that I've seen where it was it dealt with the second generation people who have been impacted by the Holocaust. So it's definitely unique. And I think a lot of people are interested in this topic. If I may add to that, the idea of a book by second generation survivors is not unique, especially in this era, possibly again, as Simone said, because of COVID, where we turn inward and delve into our legacies. And we're not even the only second generation or generation after she keeps one was recently published in the United Kingdom. And I went to a Zoom book launch for that. What makes our collection unique is that to our knowledge, it's the only one that was written by a single intentional community of memory keepers. And our voices in services have served to amplify one another's. And um, because of the nature of our relationship and the fact that we all worked with the same developmental editor, I think our stories amplify each other's as well. Simone, your father was a German Jewish Holocaust survivor who escaped from Hitler and your mother was a French Catholic whose own mother was a leader of the French resistance. 
How much of their stories did your parents share with you over the years? A lot of it was we, my, me and my three brothers learned through kind of an osmosis. They, my father talked with me briefly about when he was in a camp and he had to dig a hole in the ground, he and this other man, to, to uh, avoid uh, the guards when they were going to do something terrible to them. And they dug a hole and put them there and they breathed through straws until the, you know, so I, I had, that was the first glimpse. But um, he had fled from Berlin when he was 17. His father was a very famous diagnostician in Berlin and was at a patient's house when the patient's son was stoned to death in the schoolyard. And so my my father's father went home and sent my father right away against his mother's wishes, sent him to Switzerland. And he ended up in Lyon because my grandmother, Blanche Malino, ran a cover school for, for people that were escaping Hitler. And so that's how my parents met. But she was from a Catholic, French Catholic family and a very anti-Semitic one at that. But they were 100% committed to helping people in need. They're good, good Christians, good Catholics. So my father's last name was Judah. So it caused something of a commotion between them because of the different heritages. So we felt because of my father's escape and because my mother had to go into exile with him when they came to the States, we, we felt that through them, through their way, they got angry at each other or us, or, you know, we could, we, we sensed their pain and their trouble and their grief and that it was unresolved, but it wasn't as direct as some other people. Some, some people's parents spoke, but a lot of people's parents were not able to. So it was my experience of the trauma was firsthand, but not directly, evidently, obviously, because of the Holocaust. Let's put it that way. And Joy, what about you? My parents came from Krakow, Poland. They had been in that city for hundreds of um, cousins back to the Sorry, Joy, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute because you faded out. Can you just start over from Krakow? <clears throat> Certainly. Um, my parents are from Krakow, Poland. Um, both families had been there for hundreds of years. My mother traced her lineage back to the expulsion from Spain in the 1400s. They met in Krakow. They married as young adults while they were on the run before returning to the Krakow ghetto, which counterintuitively enough was relatively safer than being out there in the world alone. Um, my grandmother and my aunt, my mother's sister, returned to the ghetto as well after my maternal grandfather was captured and sent to his death. So they um, were together in the Krakow ghetto and then in the first labor camp called Płaszów, which is featured in the movie Schindler's List. And then they were split up to different camps. And my father, as I describe in my chapter, spent months and finally found my mother several months after the war ended. She and my aunt were hospitalized after a grievous injury. They were, they and my grandmother were run over by, deliberately run over by a tank during a death march, which my grandmother did not survive. And my mother and my aunt each had a leg amputated from those wounds. So the thing that was most remarkable of many remarkable aspects of my family story is that in spite of the horror and the degradation, um, there was a cultural life in the camps. And my mother and aunt were accomplished poets writing verse on scraps of paper, smuggled from the slave labor factory. So, you know, they had gotten a progressive education in a modern Jewish secondary academy. They learned classical Polish, Polish poetry and modern Polish verse. So their wartime poems were very much informed by that progressive education. They were writers to the end of their days. And my mother was a storyteller who had, for someone, you know, who didn't come of age in a particularly psychologically minded era, she had an intuitive knack for telling stories when I was a young child in a kind of fairy tale quality. So it told the stories of the family members she was determined that we learn about without overwhelming us. So I got from my mother a pretty steady stream of unfolding stories. My father was much more reticent, but if he cried out from nightmares, as he did very often, my mother would soothe me and say he had a bad dream about the war and would tell me what happened to those people and why he was upset. So I heard a lot, but like many of our cohort, I heard in fragments. And it's been a life's journey to integrate those fragments into the kind of written form that you'll see in the book. Do you feel like it was 
was, it was like putting pieces of a puzzle together. Absolutely. And each chapter in our book puts the puzzle pieces together in a unique formation, which makes it quite enriching to read. So Joy, how was your life impacted by the intergenerational trauma and living in the shadow of the Holocaust? I was raised with certain rules in my family that were grounded in my parents' best efforts to keep me safe. One was don't take chances. Another was don't call attention, try to blend in. They were thrilled that I came out with blue eyes and straight hair because as my father said, never underestimate the power of passion. I remember a conversation with him during the height of the civil rights era in the late 1960s. And he said he was blonde and blue eyed and passed as an Aryan for a time. And he said the difference between our groups with whom he identified strongly is that if you pass as a non-Jew, people can get to know the content of your character before they learn the bad news that you're a Jew and African-Americans have no such luxury in our country. So not calling attention, trying to blend in, trying to be as American as possible, not taking risks. My mother had a horror of what she called falling games because of her injury. So when my brother broke an ankle in sports, she was mighty upset. I was a sedentary child and they quite liked that. So those things left an imprint, but also left an imprint of being very, very sensitive to injustice and discrimination. And Simone, tell me how you relate to that or how your story might differ. You had asked us what unique about us. And I have to say that what's unique to me about Joy is is the her, I mean, as an editor, but also just as a person in the group and a leader of the group. I don't think I've ever met anyone who is so compassionate the way she listens and non-judgmental and inclusive and gentle. And uh, so that's totally different from my experience growing up at home. And it's a, it's a bomb to the soul. I mean, it, it's really a remarkable gift that she has and the story she's describing. My own experience with my family was the opposite. Um, I became a victim of massive psychic trauma because of what went on with my parents and and us and um, was finally able to get help from a psychoanalyst who was himself a Holocaust survivor and had been in several camps and death marches and had treated many people. So he understood uh, that trauma has its own issues aside from the normal psychological and nobody else had ever gotten that before. So I'm very blessed to have finally found someone that could help me put the pieces of myself back together again. <laughs> so it's I couldn't have a more of a different background than Joy. And I am I just am so fortunate to know that that's possible, what she has. And if I may return the compliment, Thank you, Simone. When we were first invited to shift our focus in this book from our parents' stories to our own, Simone was led by example, first in services and then in the book, um, to show how self-examination and and in in particular writing is a pathway for post-traumatic healing and growth. Thank you. Absolutely. It's all about healing. And this heritage is very painful and very real no matter what. And so there's um, a definite healing process that that we witnessed or didn't witness with our parents and that we have inherited as a result, apart from any normal stuff that we might have had. Do you feel like writing these stories and and telling your story has uh, impacted your healing and your personal growth? Well, for me, writing saved my life. I mean, I started quite young as a uh, as a poet and then a playwright. And it, it literally allowed me, I, I was kind of experienced feelings very intensely. And it allowed me a way to express them and understand them in an acceptable way. And writing the chapter, I mean, it, it, it was painful and difficult. And it's painful and difficult to, when you're talking about it with people. I mean, you're very vulnerable in a sense, you're really bearing your soul. But it's definitely healing. And writing, it, it's just, I think that's why I became a writer. So it, it made a huge difference. And this book in particular, on this particular subject, I learned in this group that we have post-traumatic stress and we have post-traumatic growth. And I love that because growth is what it's all about. And I would echo that the process of writing for me was transformative. I'm 
a recently retired psychologist. I've done a lot of technical writing. I've done a lot of report writing. I write good letters to people, but memoir is brand new to me. And when we started to explore how would we take this deep dive, one of the co-editors, Rita Ben, who has done some memoir writing workshops, sent us some writing prompts. And I sat down at the computer and the words started pouring out of me. I never thought of myself as someone who had that indeed I do, and that I can claim my family lineage as a writer. I thought that the gene had skipped me. You know, my mother and aunt were poets. My daughter is a published poet. And I just figured I'm my father's kid and I don't do that, but I do. And that's been enormously exciting. It's also a way for me to continue my legacy as a healing professional, having worked as a psychologist for 45 years, because our stories are particular, but also tap into universal experiences for anybody who grew up in the shadow of their parents' suffering. And in a um, book club that we're now doing for our congregation, we're hearing great resonances from people who don't have a direct link to the Holocaust specifically, but who relate to our journeys in powerful ways. Um, and that's been deeply gratifying. We have a lesson to share with the wider world, particularly in these times. So I'm curious to know about the story that you each contributed to this anthology. Joy, tell me a little bit about your story. My chapter starts in childhood through the Lens of a young child hearing her father cry in the night, here seeing, bearing witness to her mother taking off and putting on a wooden leg, which, by the way, was not permitted to my older brother because it was a kind of nakedness that a boy should not see. Um, the sense making I tried to make of that as a young child, the role of my mother's storytelling and my father's more occasional anecdotes, growing into greater awareness of the fuller story growing into greater awareness of my mother's writing. And in fact, as I was thinking, what's unique about me, um, how many teens serve as their mother's correspondence and manuscript secretary when they're developing a novel. So having a front row seat to my mother's own creative process and seeing the healing power of writing for her. The struggle to differentiate from my parents when I separated from them to go off to college, thus triggering their separation trauma and how I came to peace with all of that in my adult life. Simone, can you tell me about your story? So my chapter, I start by talking about my many names. I have, uh, my name is Simone Naomi Patut Judah Press Shapiro. And each one has its own heritage in terms of my mother's French background, my father's Jewish background, and one name in particular had to do with the fact that I was a, born a woman, a female, and my father, you know, had a little bit of it. Took him by surprise, put it that way. <laughs> and then I, I made decision early on to include some of my poetry throughout my life because it really, in and of itself, tells the story of important moments in my life as I developed. I, as I mentioned before, I become a, a victim of massive massive psychic trauma and the poetry was a way of of helping me get through that and and deal with unbearable pain and so the the poetry tells the story as well about the traumas that I experienced at my parents hands that my brothers and I experienced at my parents hands and the the healing that started to take place when I found a doctor and I talk about that and include a poem that I wrote about him and how much he helped me and how much I, I loved my parents, just was sorry that they weren't able to, to come to terms with their experience. It wasn't part of what they were able to do. So my story is very personal in that way. And it tells my, my story in a way more than my parents, although I do, of course, include them. My father, my mother was Catholic, but she became, she, she converted to Judaism so that we could be raised as Jews, so that we could be second generation, so there would be another generation. And but, you know, I think it's a difficult thing to renounce your religion, you know, if you're religious. And I, I think that was a huge difficulty for her and undealt with, you know. So that's kind of what I talked about. It's just the, the, all the conflicts and then the issues, the problems that we were facing. And in spite of the fact that my father's a, a brilliant scientist, he invented a machine that changes salt water to fresh water for Israel. He got big awards. He became very wealthy. Um, we lived in a very wealthy neighborhood. And yet there's just all this happiness. So I realized, you know, money isn't the answer. 
And sure, it's nice, but um, I learned very early that the key to happiness isn't necessarily money. Sure can't hurt a lot of time, but that's more what what I did in mind. I think that encapsulates my chapter, which is called chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, which is um, a word for loving kindness. And that's what my doctor taught me about and showed me and gave me. And Simone, what is next for you? What are you most excited about these days? Well, I am working on some screenplays. And I I have two in particular that I'm working on that I'm excited about and learning as I work with producers and managers and a wonderful screenwriting group that I'm a part of that I still have a ways to go. I thought I had pretty much done one, but I, I, I'm not, I, I kind of, I think I tried to market it too early, but it was an important experience that I had. And I, I am very technologically disadvantaged, let's put it that way. So I have a lot to learn. And if I'm going to be a screenwriter, so I'm, I'm learning from a lot of different places I mean, about that aspect and working on developing and trying to tell the stories, the two, these two stories filmically. And a film is more like a poem in terms of imagery, but it's really much more difficult than you can imagine. I never, you know, I wonder why I'm not writing a novel because I love novels. So I'm excited about that. I'm working on a third book of poetry called Pieces of Thunder. I've had two books published and I'm working on making, finishing two blankets that I promised my daughters I'd make that I abandoned during COVID and definitely bit off more than I could chew, (laughs) knitting an entire blanket, you know, double bed blanket for these two daughters of mine. But I'm excited to be getting back to that and just spending time with my daughters and my husband and a wonderful for life, this wonderful friends. And I feel very blessed. That's great. Thank you. And Joy, what about you? What are you excited about? As part of the um, editing team of the book, I'm committed to promoting the book, which did I mention I was raised not to call attention to myself. So that's <laughs> been a big growth area for me. We're working with a publicist. We have a good number of events already confirmed and many more in the planning stages. So um, getting the message of this book out into the world is my top priority. I I also have at least a dozen writing prompts to do more writing about my own story with regard to my family of origin and also more writing in general. I have my 50th college reunion coming up next month and we were given a writing prompt to contribute to a class memoir and 2,000 words poured out of me. So I want to harness that and um, continue in that direction in my retirement. And is there anything else you'd like to tell us about you or your work, Joy? You know, I'm I'm very happily and newly retired. My my professional career as a psychologist was deeply important to me. It involved a variety of leadership activities and a great deal of mentoring and teaching. So, I look forward to channeling that into school presentations when it comes to that and so forth. I would also just say that to get more information about our book, your listeners can visit Second Generation voices.com to follow our event schedule, to ask us to present to book clubs or other groups, um, and to see more reviews as they come in. And buy the book on Amazon or local bookstores. Barnes and Noble or independent bookstores, wherever you buy your books, you can find this wonderful book. Simone, where can listeners find out more about you? Well, also, you know, my bio and my, uh, you know, a lot of stuff about me is, is on that website, the 2G Voices. Uh, website, but I also have my own website, Simone Yehuda, www.simoneyehuda.com, and it, it's been updated, and uh, so that would give a lot of information. I'm also happy, I'm on LinkedIn, and if people want to email me, I'm happy to answer questions. If they have, you know, anything at all, I'm really open to that, uh, simone.yehuda at gmail.com. And I think one thing that we've learned doing, you know, and I'm also very committed to promoting the book and, and keeping that, uh, doing what's necessary necessary in the future to keep it in the public eye and to get it out to as many people as possible heard. No, I think that's great. I want to let our listeners know that I will be linking your websites as well as the website for the book in the show notes. So you'll be able to get on the website and find out more about these two wonderful women. It was great to have you on the show, Simone and Joy. Thank you so much for being guests on the Curious Professor podcast. Thank Thank you so much, Karen. Really enjoyed it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now for the answer to this episode's trivia question, what does the Hebrew word chased mean? While chased does not have a precise English translation, the word is often translated as loving kindness. It means giving oneself fully with love and compassion. 
We'll end the show with something punny. What type of blood do the best proofreaders have? Typo. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Curious Professor podcast. If there's a person, place, artifact, or natural wonder that has sparked your curiosity and you'd like for me to feature it on the show, please let me know. My website is thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to the Curious Professor podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to become part of my community of curiosity seekers, be sure to visit my website, thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com, and join Dr. B's Hive. Until next time, always be learning and be curious with Dr. B.